Chapter 9 The Bird Sisters Not a bird upon the tree, but half forgave his being human. The brothers who knew Francis best in these years, who shared his joys and sorrows, and even his thoughts, have many stories to tell of his love for flowers and birds and animals. When they were planting their little pieces of ground around the poor huts in the plain, he used to bid them leave a corner of good earth for our little sisters the flowers. Once in the marketplace of Siena, he rescued a pair of doves from being sold. He gathered them up in his robe, saying, Little sister doves, you are simple and good and pure. Why have they captured you? I will save you from death and make you nests for your little ones. There is a pretty story of the friendship of Francis with a family of red throats who used to come and pick up crumbs on the table where the brothers were eating. Another story is of a frightened hare which someone had caught in a trap. Come to me, brother hare, said Francis, and the trembling little beast fled to him and let itself be caressed by his kind hands. It even refused to run away on being set down, so that Francis was obliged to carry it into the woods and leave it free to find its way home. One day Francis was in a little boat, being ferried across the lake of Rieti, when a boatman made him a present of an uncommonly large fish, just caught and gasping for breath. The gift was accepted gladly, but in a minute the astonished giver saw Francis drop the creature back into the water, bidding it thank God. Probably neither the fish nor the fisherman understood the tender heart that could not bear to see anything suffer pain. Yet, doubtless in its own way, the poor fish was grateful to feel the cool water again, and it is to be hoped that it kept away from nets and hooks forever after. With birds, Francis felt himself always among dear and happy friends. Once, these little companions were even too noisy in their merrymaking. It was on a day when Francis stood up to speak to a great crowd of men and women gathered out of doors. Hundreds of swallows were wheeling all about, as one often sees them of a spring afternoon, twittering and calling with shrill voices while they hunt their supper on the wing. This time the birds flew so low and were so many and so loud that Francis could not make himself heard. Suddenly he turned from his audience and spoke into the air. It is time that I should have my turn to talk, little sister swallows, he said. Be quiet and listen until I have finished. And so says the old story, the swallows obeyed his voice. A short time after, Francis went on his way toward Bivania a small town on the southwestern side of the Umbrian Valley. Looking off from Assisi, one may still see the road by which he must have walked. Two or three of his brothers were with him, but Francis was not talking. His head was bent, and he seemed to be thinking so hard that he had forgotten all about his comrades. Suddenly, as it is written in an old book called The Little Flowers of St. Francis, he lifted up his eyes and saw many trees along the side of the road, and in their branches an almost countless number of birds, so that Francis wondered and said to his companions, Wait for me here, and I will go and preach to my sisters the birds. And he went into the field and began to preach to the birds that were on the ground, and quickly those that were up in the trees came to him, and they all kept quiet while Francis finished his sermon, and, even then, they did not go away until he had given them his blessing. And when Francis went among them, touching their heads, not one of them moved. The substance of the sermon that Francis made was this, My bird sisters, you are much beloved by God your Master, and always, in every place, you ought to praise him, because he has given you liberty to fly everywhere and he has given you also clothing double and triple. You are loved also by the air which he has given to you, and moreover you neither sow nor reap, and God feeds you, and gives you the rivers and the fountains to drink from. He gives you the mountains and the valleys for your refuge, and the tall trees for your nests, and although you do not know how to spin or sow, 
God clothes you and your children. God must love you much, since he gives you so many blessings. And therefore, be careful, my sisters, of the sin of ingratitude, and always seek to praise God. While Francis said these words, all those birds began to open their beaks, and stretch out their necks, and spread their wings, and bend their heads reverently toward the earth. And, with acts and songs, they showed that the Holy Father gave them great pleasure. And Francis rejoiced, and made merry together with them. And he wondered much at such a multitude of birds, and at their beauty, and at their attention and tameness. And he devoutly thanked God for them. The old story goes on to tell how, after the sermon, the great flock of birds rose into the air with wonderful songs and flew away north and south and east and west, even as the poor brothers must go, who, like the birds, had nothing of their own, but depended only on God's care of them. This story of the birds was so much loved and so often told that years afterward the painters liked to paint it on the walls of the churches. You may still see in the great church of St. Francis of Assisi a picture by the painter Giotto of the gray-robed brothers standing among the birds and telling them so simply that it really seemed as if a bird might understand of the Father, without whose love not even a sparrow falls. One night, Brother Francis and Brother Leone, God's little lamb, were alone together. It was May, and in a great ilex tree near them a nightingale was singing sweet and clear in the stillness. To Francis the song seemed all joy and praise. Come, Brother Leone, he cried, let us sing too, and see which will tire first our voices, or that of the nightingale. But Brother Leone, who was, perhaps tired and sleepy, excused himself, saying that he had no voice. Then Francis, his heart filled with the gladness of the beautiful springtime, went out into the darkness, and, all night long, the man and the bird sang wonderful songs of love and praise. But even God's troubadour could not outdo the little unseen singer in the ilex tree. And, at last, Francis owned merrily that Brother Nightingale was victor in this strange singing match. End of chapter 9 The Bird Sisters Chapter 10 Brother Wolf Said Grey Brother, Where shall we lair today? For from now we follow new trails. By Kipling The huts in the plain below Assisi were the home of the little poor men, in so far as they had a home. But, like the troubadours and knights errant, they were wanderers always, just as Sir Lancelot and Sir Gawain would ride away from the court of King Arthur to fight for any forlorn lady, or for any hard-pressed knight. So Brother Leone or Brother Francis would set forth at any moment to carry help to the miserable. But the brothers went on foot, and they wore no armor, and fought no battles, yet they had need to be as brave as the best of knights, for they went among the sick and cared for those who were dying of most terrible diseases. They met fierce enemies too, since many people hated them, because they spoke without fear in the streets, saying that pride and greed and war are wicked, and that folk should live by love and labor, not by fighting and robbery. When people saw that the brothers really lived as they preached, that when they were stoned by cruel hands and abused by cruel tongues, they returned only gentleness for anger, many began to listen gladly, and even barons and princes came to love Francis and his brothers, as the poor and wretched had loved them from the first. Francis himself had a manner so sweet and winning that no one could refuse to listen to him and sometimes he used to be sent for to make peace between two enemies, because even angry men, listening to his voice, forgot their hatred, and were ready to forgive and to be friends again. The stories say, moreover, that he could control not fierce men only, but the fiercest of wild beasts. One of the places which Francis often visited is a little city called Gubbio, about fifteen miles north of Assisi. 
Almost all the way the road lies across the high mountains and the traveler can overlook the long Umbrian Valley. From these bare heights Perugia and Assisi seem to lie low, but far to the south on clear days the tops of the tallest Apennines stand out against the sky. Before the road drops to the narrow valley which lies below the gates of Gubbio, Francis, who loved the mountains, always turned to look back at the great peaks, shining white in winter time, or soft and blue if it were summer. Gubbio looks not unlike Assisi, but is still more steeply built up a mountainside. In those days, the stone houses seemed to huddle within the great city walls for shelter, for there was frequent fighting at Gubbio. Even in times of peace, people were often afraid to go beyond the gates, because in the forests and caves on the mountain lived daring robbers and brigands. Besides the savage men, there were also savage beasts, and the shepherds feared for their lambs and kids when they heard the howling of the wolves at night. Once, when Brother Francis came to Gubbio, all the city was in terror because of a wolf, the largest and fiercest ever known. The huge creature prowled about the country, devouring sheep and goats. But, worse than that, it fell upon men and had killed more than one shepherd. No man dared to go out of the gates alone, and even three or four together went armed as if to battle for the beast came close to the city walls, and his strength was as that of three hunters. Bands of citizens had been out to seek the wolf, but had found only the track of his big feet and the bones of the victims that he had eaten. Every night the folk of Gubbio, safely barred within their stone houses, told a new story of the four-footed enemy, how a shepherd had lost his fattest sheep and two of his best dogs, how a soldier, riding alone toward evening from the next town, had seen a great gray creature moving in the woods by the roadside, and had spurred his horse to its best speed, and reached the gate with the beast close at the heels of the frightened horse. Night after night the children of Gubbio shivered in their beds, thinking of a long shadow that crept about the city walls in the moonlight and seeming to hear the pad of four swift feet coming nearer and nearer. Brother Francis had been often in Gubbio, and was well known there, and much loved, and therefore all the people turned to him with the stories of their suffering. He was sorry, says the old tale, to see the folk wishing, but not daring, to go outside the gates, because the wolf was most terrible and fierce. To the astonishment and horror of everybody, Francis declared that he would himself go out and meet the wolf. Though all the crowd begged him not to venture, and filled his ears with accounts of the cruelty of the beast, the little poor man, followed by one or two brothers, went out from the city gate and down the road toward the spot where the wolf was thought to lurk. Behind the brothers came the citizens of Gubbio, still frightened but curious to see what would happen, and, it may be, quieted by the coolness and fearlessness of Francis. Close at the heels of the brothers marched certain venturesome boys, and at the very end of the procession dangled a group of smaller, timider children, round-eyed and open-mouthed, who clutched each other's hands and were always ready to scamper home at a moment's warning. About a quarter of a mile beyond the gate, where a wood of tall oaks and walnuts shadowed the road, those who were nearest turned pale at the sight of the wolf, coming swiftly along with his great jaws open, eager to spring upon Brother Francis, who walked ahead and alone. He went, not as a soldier goes to meet an enemy, but as one might go out to meet a welcome friend. As the unarmed man and the wild beast neared each other, Francis called cheerily, Come hither, brother wolf. I ask you, for Christ's sake, to do no harm to me nor to anyone. Then the crowd saw with wonder that the terrible wolf stopped running, and that the great wicked jaws closed, and presently the creature came softly up to brother Francis 
and meek as a lamb, lay down at his feet. And Francis spoke to him as one man might reason with another. Brother Wolf, you do much harm in all this countryside, and you have committed many crimes, hurting and killing God's creatures. Not only have you killed and eaten beasts, but you have dared to kill men, made in God's image, and therefore you deserve to be punished like the worst of thieves and murderers. And all the people cry out and murmur against you, and everybody is your enemy. The wolf lay perfectly still, with his head flat in the dust of the road, and his red tongue lolled out like that of a winded hound. The people forgot their fright, and spread themselves in a circle, that all might see and hear. The children tiptoed closer to look at the monster who had filled all their dreams with terror. But I wish, Brother Wolf, went on the voice of Francis, to make peace between you and this folk, so that you shall not harm them any more, and they shall forgive you all your misdeeds, and neither the men nor the dogs shall trouble you any longer. Then, with body and head and tail, the great wolf seemed to agree to all that Brother Francis said. Perhaps the wolf somewhat wondered what he should do for dinner, if he could not kill a sheep nor a child. Perhaps he was so charmed by this strange, gentle voice that he forgot all about his dinner. Brother Francis did not forget, as his next words showed. Brother Wolf, he said, since you are honestly willing to make and keep this peace, I promise you that, as long as you live, the men of this place shall give you food, so that you shall never go hungry, for I know well that it is hunger that has made you do all this evil. But I want you to promise me, in return, that you will never harm any human being, nor any animal. Will you promise me this? And the wolf nodded his head, as if he said, Yes, I promise. And Francis said, Brother Wolf, I want you to make me so sure of your promise that I cannot doubt it. The man held out his hand, and the beast lifted his paw and laid it clumsily on Brother Francis's palm, as much as to say, Here is my hand, I will keep my part of the treaty. And now, said Francis, I wish you, Brother Wolf, to come with me, and not to be afraid, and we will finish this business. Francis turned back toward the city, and the wolf walked beside him like a pet lamb, and the people of Gubbio followed, in great wonder, silently. But once within the city, they spread the news from street to street, and everybody, big and little, young and old, crowded into the square to see Brother Francis and the wolf. Beside the fountain, in the center of the square, stood the little poor man in his gray gown, with the great gray beast at his side. When he spoke, his clear voice carried far, and all the crowd fell silent, striving to hear. Listen, my friends, said Francis. Brother Wolf, who is here before you, has promised me on his honor never to hurt you again in any way, and you, in your turn, must promise to give him all that he needs. I will go surety for him that he will keep his promise. And all the people, with one voice, pledged themselves to feed the wolf and not to harm him. Then, before them all, Brother Francis said to the wolf, And you, Brother Wolf, promise again before all this people that you will keep faith with them and will hurt no man nor animal nor any living thing. Then the wolf knelt down and bent his head and said as well as he could with his body, his head and his ears, that he meant to keep his word. And Brother Francis said, Give me your hand here, before all the people, as you did outside the gate. And the big gray paw was laid again in the hand of Brother Francis, while all the people shouted to heaven for joy that God had sent so good a man to deliver them from so terrible a beast. After this, Brother Wolf lived in Gubbio, and went about tamely from door to door, even entering the houses, without doing harm or being harmed. He was well fed and politely treated by everybody, and not a dog dared to bark at him. 
he must have led a long life of evil doing before his change of heart, for, at the end of two years, he died of old age. When he died, all the citizens of Gubbio mourned for him greatly, for his own sake, and because the sight of him walking so meekly through the streets had made them always remember the goodness of Brother Francis. End of chapter 10 Brother Wolf Chapter 11 The Three Robbers Brother Francis made many journeys through the mountains and valleys about Gubbio, and all the people, rich and poor, came to know the drooping gray figure and the face that was always so cheerful and kind, though often it looked pale and thin. One of the little cities where he used to visit is called Borgo San Sepulcro. It lies at the foot of a mountain, and outside its walls was a deep moat with a drawbridge before each gate, for a city on a plain is harder to defend in battle than a city on a hill. Today the moat is dry and planted with vineyards, but the old walls are solid still, though they are so covered by trailing vines that an army of small boys might scale them. From Borgo San Sepulcro, Brother Francis visited the three little villages that lay each at the gates of a great castle, as a dog crouches at his master's feet. For village and villagers belong to the lord of the castle, and though he might be cruel and ill-treat them, they had no other protection in war save that of the castle courtyard, which was big enough to shelter them all. One day, in a place called Monte Casale, about two hours' walk from Borgo San Sepulcro, a youth from one of the castles came to Brother Francis. He had a great name and great wealth, and the common people stood aside to let him pass. The youth knelt down humbly before Francis and said, Father, I wish to be one of your poor brothers. Francis looked down kindly into the eager young face and replied, My son, you are used to a beautiful home, to rich clothing and delicate food. How will you endure poverty and hardships such as ours? But the lad answered simply, Can I not bear all these things by the help of God, even as you do? Francis was greatly pleased by this answer. He joyfully received the boy into the company of the little poor men, giving him the name of Brother Angelo, and his trust in the new brother was so great that a little time after he made him a guardian of a small house nearby where some of the brotherhood were living. The house stood in a wild region of mountains and forests, and at this time three famous and terrible robbers lived in the woods and were the terror of the neighborhood. On a certain day, when Francis was absent, these men came to the house of the brothers and asked for food. Brother Angelo answered them sharply, saying, You cruel thieves and murderers, you are not ashamed to steal what others have worked to earn, and you even have the face to ask for that which has been given in charity to God's poor. You are not fit to live, since you reverence neither men nor yet God who made you. Away with you, and do not let me see you here again. The robbers went off with dark looks and muttered curses, but Brother Angelo felt well satisfied with himself, and perhaps a little proud that he had been so good a guardian. An hour later, Brother Francis returned to the house, weary with long walking on the rough mountain paths. Over his shoulder he carried a bag of food that had been given to him for the brothers and for their poor folk. Brother Angelo greeted him with the story of the three robbers. He doubtless expected praise for having rid the house of such dangerous evildoers, but to his surprise Francis looked at him sadly and sternly and said, My son, you have behaved most cruelly. One should receive sinners with gentleness, not with harshness, even as Jesus Christ who said, They that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. And I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Moreover, Jesus himself 
used often to eat with the most wretched sinners, and you, my son, have forgotten all charity and the teaching of Christ. Go then quickly, take this food, and follow the robbers as fast as you can, until you overtake them. When you find them, give them this bread from me, and kneel down before them, and confess your fault, and beg them, in my name, not to do any more evil. Tell them that if they will give up their wicked life, I will find food for them always, and they shall want for nothing. It was a hard minute for Brother Angelo. He had looked for praise, and instead he was being reproved by the lips that had never before spoken any but gentle words to him. Surely this command was strange and unreasonable. How could he run after the men he had just driven away? How could he ask pardon of such wretches? But as he looked into the face of Brother Francis, so stern and yet so pitiful, a thought that he had never known before stirred in his heart, the thought that it is possible to love not only those who are good and gentle, but even the wicked and vile, for it was easy to see that Francis loved and pitied these robbers, who were prowling about not far away, hungry and fierce like wild beasts. When this new thought came to Angelo, all his anger disappeared, and he was ready and glad to obey Brother Francis. He threw the bag over his shoulder and ran along as fast as he could by the narrow path that the thieves had taken. The way was steep and stony, but he did not notice. There had been a thunderstorm, but now the sun came out, and the wind piled the clouds white and high above the mountain tops, and the sky was deep blue. The sunshine seemed to Angelo, like the face of Brother Francis, shining upon him and driving away all his hard and cruel thoughts. He began to be more and more sorry as he remembered the rough words he had used to the beggars. As he went on, seeing no one, sometimes through the woods, sometimes over stony pastures, where sheep were feeding, he began to think, Suppose I cannot find the men. Suppose they have taken some other road, and are wandering in the woods, hungry and miserable. At the thought, he pulled the bag higher on his shoulder, and hurried along faster and faster. Just as the path made a sharp turn and entered the woods again, Angelo saw the three wretched men sitting under a chestnut tree, trying in vain to find a few nuts among the husks, for it was late autumn and the nuts were all gathered or decayed. As Angelo came running along the path, the three robbers eyed him sullenly, and when they recognized the haughty youth who had driven them so harshly from his door, they were ready to fall upon him and beat him. A minute later they sat in speechless surprise, for the boy threw himself and his bag down before them, crying, Here is food, my brothers. Take it, and forgive my cruelty. Brother Francis sends me to you, and begs you for his sake to accept the food. And he bids me tell you that, if you will give up your wicked life, he will care for you and feed you always. Perhaps there were never three men more astonished than the robbers of Monte Casale. They devoured the food greedily, for they were starving. But as they ate, they began to say among themselves, What miserable creatures we are, who live by thieving and murder, and fear neither men nor God. And here is this youth, who said to us only what we richly deserved, asking our pardon and bringing us food and promising that the holy brother Francis will forgive and care for us. The three robbers became sorrier and sorrier as they remembered all their wicked deeds. By and by one of them said, Let us go ourselves to brother Francis and ask him if God will yet forgive us. It may be that the good brother will help us to live like honest folk once more. Thus it came about that the three infamous robbers of Monte Casale joined the company of little poor men, and spent the rest of their days in doing good and not evil to their fellow men. End of chapter 11 The Three Robbers Chapter 12 Nurse and Patient One day in summer, Francis of Assisi 
came out from the city gate and walked down the mountain on his way to Portiuncula. He took a path that he loved well because it led him by the chapel of San Damiano, where, long ago, the good priest had hidden him from his father's anger, and where many times in that first year of trouble he had found shelter and comfort. He loved the little chapel the more because he had helped to rebuild it. He knew the very stones that he had laid with his own hands. Now the place was dear to him for another reason. For house and garden and little chapel belonged to a sisterhood, whose leader, Sister Chiara, had come to him in the early days at the Portiuncula, asking that she might live the same life of poverty and service as that of the little poor men. To her, and to all her company, Francis had been friend and father, and it made him happy that his old refuge had become their home. From the gate of San Damiano, Francis could see the whole valley, where the August air quivered with heat, and the river bed lay white and dry. The little huts in the plain were hidden in deep forest, and he thought how cool the shadow of the oaks and tall walnut trees would be at the end of his long journey. Hot as it was, he did not take the shortest road, but turned into a footpath that led to the leper hospital. He was barefooted and bareheaded. His robe was the color of the dusty path. He walked with bent head, wearily, for he was not strong, and the air at the foot of the mountain was still and close. Under the trees, men and women were resting through the hottest hours and the children were playing quietly. A baby lay sound asleep on the brown grass, where the shadow of broad vine leaves fell across its face. A tired-looking donkey nibbled sadly along the hedgerows, which were dry and dusty, for the August rains had not begun. As Francis drew near, the men and women rose to greet him, and the children left their play to run and kiss his hand for no one in all the countryside was so beloved as the little poor man. He petted the children, he found a greener twig for the donkey, and called him Brother Ass. He lingered to ask and answer questions, for he knew all the peasants, and they told him all their joys and sorrows. As he turned to go, a little girl, pushed forward by her mother, came toward him timidly, holding up a basket covered with vine leaves. The sun shone on the child's curly head and tiny brown arms. As she lifted the basket higher, the green leaves slipped aside, showing the deep purple of the August figs. Will you accept them, father, for your supper at the Portiuncula? The mother said. They are ripe and sweet. The child said nothing, but stood smiling up into the kind eyes of the little poor man. Brother Francis took the basket and bent to kiss the giver. God reward you, little one, he said. I will carry the fruit to our sick brothers at the hospital. One of the first duties which Francis had taught his little poor men was the care of the lepers, and some of the brothers always stayed in the hospital, and Francis himself went often to nurse and comfort the sufferers. On this August day, to his surprise, he found his brother nurses worn and discouraged. They turned eagerly to him, as always, when they were in trouble, and they told him a sad story. Father, one of them said, do not be angry with us, nor think that we have been impatient and have forgotten our rule of humbleness and service. There is here a leper so wretched in mind and body that not one of us can help him, nor even control him. He is in constant pain, and nothing gives him relief, and he is as bad in spirit as in body. For he shrieks and curses when we come near him, and his words are so wicked that we are afraid to listen. I will go to him, said Francis, and they showed him the bed where the leper lay, muttering curses still with his parched and swollen lips. God give you peace, dear brother, said Francis, as he stepped to the bedside. What peace can I have from God who has taken away from me peace? 
and every other good thing, and has made me altogether miserable, cried the leper. I am in pain day and night, and these brothers of yours do not care for me as they should. They have done nothing, he complained bitterly. I will take care of you, brother, said Francis. I will do for you whatever you wish. Then wash me from head to foot with your own hands, cried the leper, still angrily, for all my body is covered with sores, and I am loathsome, even to myself. Then Francis, very patiently, began to bathe the leper, and his hand and his words were so tender that the wretched man was soothed and ceased to curse and complain. His pain vanished too under the care of his new nurse, and as he became comfortable in body, he grew gentle in spirit, and was sorry for his unkind and wicked words. The other brothers were astonished to see the man who had given them so much trouble become suddenly gentle and patient and grateful to them all. One day, as Francis sat by the bedside, the sick man turned to him with tears in his eyes. Forgive me, brother, he said all the evil that I have spoken of you and your brotherhood. And Francis took his hand and spoke softly to him. My brother, you have suffered great pain. If you have not borne it meekly, ask God to forgive you, for his love is greater far than ours. The old story tells how, a few weeks later, the leper died, at peace with God and with all the world. End of chapter 12 Nurse and Patient